Oh, thank you, Peter. So it's going to be a morning for a couple of new things. Uh, welcome again, I guess, to everyone who showed up. So let's see. Uh, share screen. Oh, I'm going to share the screen over there. There we go. So first new thing is uh, Mastodon handles in our presentations. I don't know if that's actually going to uh, remain a thing, but I figured we'd give it a try. Second new thing to try out this morning is I'm going to turn off my video up here. We tested this this morning and it, oh. go back and turn on video down there. So that hopefully helps everyone then watch everything in one place. Um, and the last new thing is that these are all new slides. So uh, feedback will be welcome. And if there's any confusion about any of them, I guess stop me and let me know. I'm only going to really pay attention to the hand raise or if someone says something, um, I'm going to try to ignore the chat. And so that'll help us bundle all the conversation into the video itself. Um, the team will help me by raising hands if anyone needs any help or anything. So hopefully this will all work out. And what we're doing here is um, maybe instead of actually talking about what exactly next generation uh, metadata looks like, we're talking about, we're making the case for it. Right? We're saying um, it's something we need as a community and I'll kind of go through that whole process. So what this isn't is a talk about NGFF. We mentioned it a couple of times. Um, and we can talk about that more, but really we're, there are two trajectories here, at least in my mind. Um, NGFF uh, is further along uh, and this next generation metadata work is kind of following uh, as a, you know, not a distant cousin, but something of a younger cousin. Um, and we're, we're going to the same place and we just have, we have different um, infrastructure that we need to get there. And when we get there, we'll have to figure out what we're doing with this name next gen. Uh, we can't be next gen forever, but uh, that's a problem for some other time. All right. So at, in kind of the broadest sense, what we're talking about is linking our data. So how do we take data sets and how do we then uh, relate them to other data sets in, in bioimaging, but also in other spaces? <clears throat> Excuse me. That is really, you know, the same, uh, another way of, of describing the term fair really is, is linked data. Uh, for anyone who is there, you may remember that Andra Wagmester presented at OME 2021 um, on Wikidata, so a way of, of uh, linking, in his case, um, information about genes into a, a, a single platform. Um, by the way, uh, OME 2021, the URL is without a hyphen. This year, we're using a hyphen, and I'll let you figure out why on your own. Um, so Wikidata is, is probably the largest public instance of, of linked data that's out there. It's certainly the most prominent. It has something like 12 billion uh, statements in it um, about all types of life. Um, those Each of those statements are what you could also call a triple, and we'll get to what a triple is a little bit later. Um, but all of those 12 billion statements are really just one data set, and then there are so as of last year, over 1,300 individual linked open data sets, which all refer to one another. Um, and you can kind of get a feel for the progression over the, the past uh, 15 years or so. And the links between these sets of data, so these sets of statements, are, are, <clears throat> are those data sets using one another. So you, know, you have Wikidata relating to Uniprot or PubChem or all these other data sets. And that's made, made possible by, by the, the types of frameworks that we'll be talking about today. So this is the, uh, the life science subset of the overall linked data cloud. Um, as I mentioned, so Uniprot and PubChem, uh, OLS, the resources at EBI, they're all in there and, and relate to each other more or less. Um, and the question I really want to pose is how do we get involved? How do we take our bioimaging data sets and somehow link them to this kind of existing body of data. And we've been doing this for years in, in various ways, and we'll kind of look at those various ways. But moving forward, so you know, what's the path that we want to take? So here I've, I've just picked a couple of, of terms from, 
from our community. So things that we know and, and we use kind of on a regular basis, or I, I assume most of you do. Um, and the things that it would, the first thing that would be most interesting to look at today would be what of these schemas can we harmonize? So what are the models, the schema models that we're going to be looking at? Um, how will they work together? And then maybe down the road, I, I don't think we'll get it to it today, will be what are the other resources? So from other bodies of knowledge kind of around our space that we want to link to, and where are we sharing all these data sets? And we're, how are we really moving forward um, in making all this fair? So that's kind of the grand vision of what we'll be talking about. Um, very practically, um, I'll do a very brief introduction to linked data. Uh, and anyone who's put up with me for any length of time knows that that will mean I will mention RDF. Uh, thank you uh, for putting up with me. Uh, we'll kind of go through then why now is a good time to be thinking about this. Um, what are the problems? So here problems could also be called opportunities or what are the use cases? What do our users want to do with their data? Um, and we'll look at a couple of examples. Some of those have to do with NGFF and then we get into more metadata concerns. And then finally, what are the things we've attempted and are currently attempting? And maybe what are we attempting as a community together moving forward? Um, and if we're lucky and we still have energy by the time we get to the end of this, we will um, maybe be able to add some more nodes to this graph. So what are the, the, the metadata specifications that you're interested in and how do they fit into this web of metadata? And if we're really good, then we will define some of the semantics. So. Um, what are the relationships between different uh, uh, schemas? How will they work together going forward in a kind of concrete way? Or maybe that's what we knew in kind of the, the next um, conversations. Okay, I'll keep going. Like I said, feel free to interrupt me and uh, make this a bit more of a conversation. So what is linked data? So if you Google linked data, you will pretty quickly come across something called the five-star data representation, it's kind of this progression of making data ever more open and linkable. Um, it starts off with, well, just put your resource, whatever it is, and so in this case, it's a PDF, put it on the web and give it a, a, an open license so that people can use it, right? So that's already a great place to start. Um, then make the data more structured, so make it easier on the user to consume it. Uh, make it available in a non-proprietary open format. So you can kind of hear how this relates to, to bioimaging, right? This, these are things we we know and we work on. Um, here's where it starts to get more unique. Use your eyes to denote things. So make things linkable or web compatible. So when you're talking about something, give it a give it a URL that someone can actually go to and, and resolve what, what it is they're, they're talking about. And then finally link those various resources together. So if you have the URs, you can start building this web of data, which is, um, I guess, what's really our goal. Okay, so what's this RDF thing I keep talking about? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I'll kind of go through an example that's in the RDF primer, um, which is kind of part of the, the RDF specification. It's from the RDF technical group. Um, but, you know, the example here is of Bob and the Mona Lisa. Over time, we should obviously be building up examples in the bioimaging space. So maybe we can have a bioimaging RDF primer one day and in, into the not too distant future. So anyway, the graph is the fundamental representation of, of metadata in RDF. Um, and you can kind of read it from various starting points, depending on what you're interested in. But you can also just take each of these lines, each of the edges, and write it down as a sentence. So Bob is a person. He's a friend of Alice. He was born on the state. He's interested in the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa was created by Leonardo. And there's this movie which talks about the Mona Lisa. So that's each of our sentences kind of written down in a um, in an informal way. And then finally, turning those into triples is what makes it actual RDF. Um, and every statement in RDF is built up by a triple. So you have a subject, which is always a URI here in purple. Um, hopefully the colors are, are accessible for everyone. Um, you have a predicate, which you can think of kind of as a, a verb or maybe an adjective that's talking about the subject here in gray. Um, also a, always a URI. And then you have the object of the sentence, which can either be another URI, so kind of referring to something else, and then the web of, oh, excuse me, my video stopped. Um, you have the web of knowledge continuing. Or you have some terminal nodes, you have values, and those could be typed. So you can have a date, or you can have a string, or you can have other 
typed values. You can have integers. Um, and that's really it. So as a bonus, this really isn't that far. So I guess for all the, the, the biologists amongst you who I know love uh, Excel spreadsheets, it's really not that far from a table. It looks complicated. But at the end of the day, your subjects are all the rows in your tables, the predicates are your columns, and then you have the values in the cell. Um, you may need multiple tables to represent the full graph, of course, and it's actually fairly likely, but you can get it into a table. The differences are that it's fairly sparse, so the graph doesn't need to have every single predicate. Um, and so you'll have nulls in your data. The cells can be linked. So here we use kind of these, these angle brackets to represent things that are clickable or should be clickable. Um, and the values are typed as opposed to in um, spreadsheets, which, you know, it's often just a spring, uh, string. Um, and that's really kind of the, the basics of RDF. Um, what makes it in my mind, such a good starting point for us or a, a good candidate for the underlying framework that we need for next generation metadata is the fact that it's based on a large number of W3 standards, and this isn't even close to all of them. Um, just kind of looking at a couple very briefly is RDF is kind of the is this core concept here. Um, and it's, I guess, similar to the XML or the HTML um, specification, which is also developed by the W3C, so something very central, very core, um, but it's a data model as opposed to a representation. So it's a graph of data. Sorry, every time I click away, my video will stop on you. Someone can warn me about that. Um, but And then there are multiple representations, different ways of writing down that graph of data. So the one we kind of just looked at is called turtle for terse triples. Um, there are lots of animals, I guess, in the in the semantic web space. Um, there's also a JSON representation, JSON-LD, that I'll, we'll mention a couple of times, uh, which also tends to be more developer friendly. Um, and then there are higher level uh, specifications like the OWL, again, animals, OWL stands for the web ontology language. Um, it's similar to XSD from the XML space. So it's how do you talk about um, your ontologies? There's a Sparkle specification, which is similar to SQL or XPath, that lets you query your, your graphs. There are suggestions on how you should deal with CSV data that's been published to the web. There are catalogs of data like we have in the IDR, kind of on and on and on. So there's this body of work, um, and it seems like it would be a good place for us to build on top of. Um, but that means it's also... So maybe the caveat, so the, the other side of the coin is that it's something of the least common denominator. So certainly for the coders amongst us here, that means it's kind of like machine language. So it can represent everything, but you're working pretty low in the overall stack. I wasn't quite sure for the biologist, does that, would that be amino acids? Could we, you know, what's the, it's not, it's not the um, bases, but somewhere there's a layer at which, um, we can represent everything, but you really don't want to work there. So if someone has a suggestion on what that could be, let me know. Yeah, Jean Um, Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, that was the, the right place to interrupt, but I just wanted to to um, maybe give a little bit of uh, context also in this uh, for why it would be relevant. Um, I'm looking with some other people at, at actually using the solid protocol for sharing images. And that basically makes... Um, um, this linked data very relevant, and that's actually um, uh, something that would be needed for sharing image with the solid uh, protocol. So I, um, I I haven't touched on solid at all here, um, but that's a really good point, and it would be interesting to talk about that, Jean Cream. Um, so for what would be my short, I'll give my short uh, ex explanation of what that is, Jean Cream, and you correct me if if you think I'm wrong. So the web, you know. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people working on the W3C standards over the you know past, I guess, 20, 30 years. Um, it started with kind of HTML and the HTTP protocol. And then, so Tim Berners-Lee is generally given credit for doing that. Um, at some, and that's a web of websites that we can all work on. At some point, uh, RDF and the semantic web uh, developed, so around, around 2000. Um, and that's a web of metadata or data. And that's kind of what I'm talking about today. And then there's this new thing that Tim Berners-Lee, which is working on, is called Solid. Um, and the idea is that everyone can run a pod where you maintain your own data. So it's a way of having 
control over your own federated data resources, um, but using the rest of the stack. So, you know, there was this kind of RD, uh, PDF, RDF linked open data uh, trajectory. I think what he's working on now with solid is, is kind of the next, it's even higher up the scale. Does that sound roughly fair? Um, and so it may well be something that we want to talk about following on from, from this conversation. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I didn't realize you were, you were working on that. Well, it's, um, it's some, uh, some project that maybe we'll uh, try to get some funding for to explore. Um, uh, so th yeah, the, the, the idea would be to, to get people to the ability to, so it depends on how you look at it. From my perspective is that people want to, uh, to use cloud services with local data. And so how do you basically make their local private data available to some cloud services or web apps and things like this. So, mm -hmm. and this is partly why Solid is, uh, has been developed also. So, but uh, yeah, it's maybe a separate discussion, but I think uh, I wanted to, to mention it because I think it's relevant. Uh, at least it would link, or it is based off this linked data concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll work well together. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I'll keep going, but if like I agree completely, raise your hand if you have something that that adds to. So I uh, next, so here comes a quote. So um, again, so solid is kind of this thing that actually works with data, and here we're really talking about this kind of low level metadata. And I'll just read out this quote: People think RDF is a pain because it is complicated. The truth is even worse. RDF is painfully simplistic, but allows you to work with real world data and problems that are horribly complicated. While you can avoid RDF, it is harder to avoid complicated data and complicated computer problems. So that's from Dan Brickley at Google and Libby Miller from the BBC, who wrote a book called Validating RDF. So, you know, if you're blaming RDF, <laughs> maybe you're putting the blame in the wrong place. Um, so let's look at, you know, what an example would um, might be in our space. So this is from a, a grant application from um, that Jason and I wrote. Um, basically trying to, to, to have this idea of being able to encapsulate your entire imaging data set um, and, and link it with other resources, right? And so I'll read through again, so kind of the example, because this is kind of the motivation where we're, what it would be nice to enable. So you have a bio sample that's living outside of your data set. So it may be a barcode or something, um, was treated with a reagent down here and that knocks out a gene. And the gene, of course, that lives at um, say NCBI or lives at, um, another resource, but it, you do have an identifier that's linking to it. Good, so we have an image I that records the activation of the sample with a light path. The light path is up here, LP, and that was corrected by a deformable mirror. Um, that was all imaged with a camera. That camera has some um, calibration information that's also stored up here. Okay, the image was then analyzed um, with a pipeline here, P, and we found a hit, which is the hit that tells us that this gene was knocked out. Um, and it has a certain confidence level, right? And then this whole bundle of information, which has a, a URI of some form here, B, probably a DOI, um, is then linked into some public resource, for example, the IDR. So that's all messy and lots to say, right? But um, I guess I'm convinced uh, that we could write all that down with RDF. And I guess that's what I'm trying to convince all of you of. All right. Um, we're, so that was kind of the end of the intro. Uh, and now we'll start looking at, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Nico. Uh, that was for you. Um, we'll start going through this projection of why now, what are the problems and what are the solutions? Um, so uh, some of you may have heard, uh, so this came out about a week ago that the NFDI for bioimage was funded. Um, so it was actually kind of up in the air whether or not I was going to try to add these into the slides or not. So that's why some of this is a bit last minute. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the NFDI is the National Research Data Initiative in Germany. Um, it was intended to fund up to 30 consortia. So kind of across the ac academic space in Germany from, um, you know, certainly the, the sciences and the life sciences, 
but into chemistry, physics, and then all the way across to the humanities. So you can see these are the, the first two rounds of uh, consortia that were funded. Um, there is language and text-based research. There is uh, material sciences, microbiota, earth, data sciences. The list kind of goes on and on. Um, uh, we applied for the third round. Um, oh, sorry. So I forgot uh, for the first two rounds, uh, knowing that these are uh, kind of people who are interested in metadata, uh, it's I guess not too surprising that they added themselves to Wikidata. So here's a query. You can type this query in and kind of play around with it. Of all the first two rounds of resources, um, of consortia, sorry. And I guess eventually uh, we will try very much to also show up here as the third round comes online. So funding doesn't start until uh, March, 2023 but we're in the process of getting going. Um, so it's fairly exciting. Um, I, I, I do have a map from Stephanie, who's the speaker of NFDI for bioimage. So I'll use that as opposed to using uh, anything in Wikidata. Um, so this is kind of all the, the participants to date. So, and again, I didn't check the, uh, the friendliness of these colors. So I'll, hopefully this works out for everyone. There are 11 applicant institutions kind of across uh, six different task areas. Um, we'll get into those in just a second. Um, NFDI itself doesn't uh, provide any hardware, although there are some discussions with uh, the European Open Science Cloud, but that hasn't uh, actually put hardware in place yet. So we have two IT providers who are um, part of the grant. So that's in Münster and in Freiburg, where we have some provision for running systems like Omero. Um, and these various metadata uh, platforms that we're going to need. Um, so I guess you'll be seeing more of that. The participating institutions all have some resources that they're getting from the grant. So they have someone to help them implement their use cases. Um, but by and large, what will, what will make all of this happen, hopefully in the German space, are a, a team of data stewards who are here at all the little sun locations, but will travel around and try to really help everyone in Germany um, yeah, in our case, make their bioimaging data fair. There are a number of use, community use, use cases, so um, people who are interested in participating but aren't necessarily getting funding, and there's a process for adding more community use cases. Um, there are also some international use cases, and in general, that's probably something we need to keep doing. It's just um, so no solution that we come in, up, up with as a part of NFDI for bioimage really makes sense solely in Germany. So how do we kind of solve that problem? So the high, the high level uh, objectives of NFDI for bioimage really are standardizing bioimaging. So the bioimaging data type itself, uh, building up infrastructure for, for sharing that in a fair manner, um, making workflows reproducible, and capacitating really more of this fair image data management. So kind of all the things that you would you would assume uh, are part of it. This graph, which I'll show a couple more times, is kind of the the fair image data life cycle and things should get fairer and fairer and more managed as you kind of go around the cycle, which I guess is what we're really talking about here is how to do that with metadata. So these are the six task areas and their leads. Uh, Susanna, who's also here, uh, her video is not on, uh, and I'll be leading task area one. Um, and what that means also is that starting in the new year, my affiliation will change to German bioimaging. Um, but that means doesn't mean I'll stop working on OME. So this is kind of just kind of expanding the project and hopefully bringing in more resources so that we can get all this stuff done. Um, so, because this really is kind of one growing Pro progression. It starts from you know the beginning of OME, and we'll talk about some of the beginnings of the metadata, at least in OME today. Um, this is obviously the German-centric view, but I think it works across the community that we've been growing, and um, I think getting fairer and uh, trying to tackle larger and larger goals uh, using solid, as um, Jean Cream pointed out. You know, these are these things really kind of amazing and and complex goals that we have. Um, yeah, and for that, we will need to build up the, the infrastructure, and hopefully it's a very shared infrastructure amongst all of us. So, okay, let's, so that's the kind of the vision-y, this is all from the, the, the grant application itself. Uh, let's start to talk about, let's get back to metadata and, and talk about specifically what is it we want to do. Um, 
one of the things we had to do in, in submitting an FDI for bioimage was to write uh, the research data management strategy for bioimaging in Germany. And part of that is how will each of the task areas represent um, the FAIR principles, right? You know, in kind of a, a point by point basis. Um, what we realized though, or what kind of I push for, and so if this goes wrong, it's my fault and we will need to come up with uh, another solution. But I'm, is that RDF, actually covers many of the, the FAIR uh, principles itself. It was built to do exactly this, and FAIR was built on the concepts that RDF started with. So it, I guess it's not, a, it's not a surprise that these things go hand in hand. And then everything that RDF can't cover, so here M is metadata, and so far metadata RDF can cover it. For data, um, we will need to do uh, some work. And often this is, you know, trying to be covered by NGFF. So this is kind of the point at which NGFF and these, ne these next generation metadata concepts come back together because, and to, to support all of the FAIR principles. So these are kind of all of the measures, i.e. deliverables, um, that we said we will provide. And probably for this conversation, two are important to, to convey. One is this idea of a fair image object, fair IO, um, which really, again, it's, it's, it's not much of a surprise. We have, similar to the image we had earlier, we have a bundle of information that we're trying to, um, trying to share with the world. It has some form of unique identifier around the outside. Um, you have a layer of metadata that's kind of linking everything together, and somewhere you have lots of binary data, right? It's not really a surprise for any of us. These are the things we want to share on a regular basis, um, and FAIR I.O. is kind of the branding we put on it. Um, it's not, though, a new file format, so I, I guess, you know, I, I would be the last to go off and do that yet again, right? Um, but it should build on all the things that we've been working on for so many years this idea of a fair digital, so it's based on the idea of this fair digital object, which is developing in, in other spaces. Um, and I don't yet understand exactly what a fair digital object is going to be. So I think, you know, it's it's early days, the, the, the rest of the community is trying to figure out that as well. And I think that's something that we want to participate in is we want to make sure that everything that we're building in bioimaging, and specifically from OME, but I think from all of you as well, should also take part in, in the FAIR digital object space so that we're, you know, we're staying at kind of the forefront of where the rest of the community is going with, with FAIR research data management. Um, the other task area that's um, quite concerned with uh, metadata is task area three, um, where it's talking about multi-model multi metadata or data association. So how can we link not just bioimaging, but how can we link out to spatial transcriptomics and into all of these other areas? Um, we will be building graph databases and trying to enable search across kind of remote resources. Um, I think those are all things that will eventually be of interest to, to many of you. So hopefully this is all a good thing for all of us, right? Um, so there was this recent um, Nature Methods uh, focus issue on reproducibility. These are just the articles that the, the applicants to NFDI for bioimage were a part of, but obviously there's you know, a long, much longer author list of each of these and there are other articles as well. So I, I think why we want to bring this up is that, you know, at the moment, so reproducible, reproducibility, again, kind of fits hand in hand with research data management and FAIR. And there are all these things that I think we're all struggling with and we very much want to get to right now. Um, and I guess the argument that I'm making here is that um, similar to formats, so what we did with NGFF, there's a need for us to have a common metadata framework to, to, to reach the things that I think we're already um, looking towards. You know, we, we have these needs, we have these requirements, and that's what we're about to go through is all these problems that we want to solve as a community. Um, and I think we'll get there faster if we could agree on a common metadata framework together. So that's kind of, that's the core of the pitch, right? So let's, let's talk about use cases. So these are things that you might want to do uh, with your metadata. Um, like I said, we'll kind of go around in order of, of the life cycle of the data, um, starting with the files, and we'll have a couple of connections to NGFF and then get into Amero and IDR and RIMBY and NBOQ. Um, but 
really, it would be interesting if at, by the end of this, you had some ideas of the things that you need to link into this network, right? Um, if we have time, I have a, a HackMD that's prepared and we can you can already start adding notes to it if you would like, if you have any ideas. Um, but certainly eventually that's where we need to go is we need to know the, the, the web of metadata that we as a community are going to try to support. I'm gonna hit the progress button and then I need to drink some. Okay, so this is not a new slide. So this is something that we've talked about uh, for ages and ages. Um, but if we think about it purely in terms of, of metadata as opposed to um, all the problems we have with, with accessing proprietary file formats, can we start to read more vendor metadata? Um, currently, what Bioformats does is it tries to read out as much metadata as possible, and it then represents that in some kind of key value format that's not standardized um, to the best of our ability. And we don't guarantee that it's all the metadata, nor do we guarantee that it's exactly correct, because it's, it's, it's again, it's our best attempt to read that metadata out. So... What would be amazing here is if we could have this common framework and provide something to the to the vendor so that they could represent the metadata in an open open format so that we can all read it um, immediately, right? Um, discussions are are starting to take place on that. Uh, let's all just keep pushing. So to to dive in a little bit more, the the features are that this enables, are extensibility in the sense that the vendors will own, can, and, and should own their own namespace. So they will get to make the decisions of what's happening with their metadata. Um, the, the, the various bits of metadata are embeddable. They can show up in the same file without confusing one another. And the language that they would have here would be more expressive. So as opposed to only having you know, a key value pair of strings, they actually could have you know, a full data syntax with arrays and dictionaries and, and all those things that they need to be able to express themselves. Um, and the hope would be that then moving forward, um, we don't need extra files, for example, and, and we can really capture all their metadata in, in a lossless fashion. So this, the question of, of um, Extra files is is fairly critical. Um, it's something that comes up with OME TIFF as well. So this is kind of the the technical specification of OME TIFF, and I bring it up because there's one exactly one location in a TIFF uh, that we can put our metadata. It's called the image description, and that's where we put OME XML, right? And so by having OME XML in this one location in a TIFF, you actually become an OME TIFF. Um, what happens though, if someone wants to add their own information? So what would a vendor do if they wanted to, to, to integrate here, um, or even other applications? So uh, we have actually run into exactly this with micromanager. Micromanager had some metadata it wanted to save. Where does that go? And the options really are either overwrite the image description tag, um, or start adding other files, right? And this becomes Diff um, difficult to then hold together. So that's one of the things, sorry, I'm clicking, there we go, that NGFF provides us is this ability to have readable open metadata. So this is the graph that I showed, sorry, the, the diagram that I showed um, on day two. Here's an OME TIFF and you have an OME czar with its features of readable metadata and I'm not talking about now, but the well-defined chunk layout and the configurable chunk sizes. But this open JSON lets us then choose. So um, currently what Bioformats to RAW is doing is, is writing OME XML into the directory itself. And a vendor or another application could add their own file. So already more flexible. You could add a sidecar file outside of the czar, but I guess this is what we really want to avoid. Um, and then there's this ability to, to add extensible um, options into the JSON itself. And so we'll probably keep several of these options open and maybe different communities will choose to use different different options here. Um, but we certainly wanna make it possible in a way to, to represent um, as much of the original intent of the applications and the vendors as, as possible. 
Okay, so that was kind of that was very brief. That was on the files. Um, what about Amero? So I don't know how long I've been hearing about it, but certainly every year um, we hear about well, how do I export all of my data out of Omero? So this is one of the original kind of graphics of uh, an Omero publication. Um, you have all the data from the OME XML that goes into the relational database, but you then have all of this other stuff, right? That's attached. That's what Omero is there for: is to to manage in a relational database all the different links and say it, you know, it it will maintain and take care of everything for you. But if some someone leaves um, in institute and needs to take all of that stuff with them, uh, at the moment there's not, or at least uh, until recently there wasn't a great solution. Um, so I'll point you at Omero CLI transfer from Eric Rodomero. Um, he's written a tool which does this. So it you run it against your Omero and you tell it what project or data set or image you want to pack together. It downloads all the stuff and it tars it up or zips it up into a single file. Um, and just as an example, in that file, you have all the original files, you have the bulk annotations stored in an HDF5 file and you have OME XML. So that's great. And I encourage you to try it out. I guess what worries me though is what happens. So two, I guess two questions. What happens as we start adding more stuff into Omero? Will this get more and more complicated? And will this bundle of stuff? Sorry, I've my I've lost my mouse again. Will it become a standard? So will we start building other applications that know how to deal with this, exactly this directory structure? And I think that's that's a conversation we need to have as we try to get you know to whatever this next gen point is is how does someone represent the totality of these very complex things you know multiple multiple imaging acquisitions all the metadata that's related and and bundle that together in one in one package um and so that's going to be a longer conversation that we try to figure out how do we how do we support this really like with ngff as we saw on day two, across a not large number of tools as opposed to kind of just one Python project, right? Um, ah, someone says I need to update a logo. Thank you. That's a constant problem. Um, I'll try my best to remember to get to that. Okay. So, oh, I forgot there's a bonus when it comes to Omero CLI transfer is it has an option um, to prepare as opposed to just kind of the standard tar, a tar bundle that is specifically in, um, designed for going to being submitted to the bioimage archive. So that may be the beginning of the process of standardization, right? So if a resource like bioimage archive says, well, this is exactly what it should look like, that may be exactly what we need to then encourage all other tools to use that format. Um, and I guess kind of looking at Matthew, then we need to think about, well, how would we work in these, these metadata concepts um, into that proposed bundle. So how would you like to someone to submit extra metadata that then is attached in particular locations? Um, so that I think that's part and parcel of the, the larger conversation. Okay. So working our way around the graph, ontologies, these are actually, this is probably the easiest one. I, I had a hard time coming up with problems for this slide, but that's okay. We need to um, maybe that says that ontologies are, are more of a solved problem. So these are the ontology lists from both the BIA and the IDR. Um, and the reason that these are kind of solved is that ontologies tend to provide a URI so that they are very linkable. Um, so here's one that happens to be used in the IDR. What maybe is a bigger question is what's the list of ontologies that we're using? The more overlap that we have, the better. Um, so that's certainly a conversation we need to have as a community. And in, at least in the case of the IDR, at the moment, we're not using the URI for the linking itself. So, you know, if you want to query for this term, you need to know that you, you query for the, the key value pair EFO term as the key, and that the value isn't the URI, but it's the, the actual identifier. So those are the kind of questions that you know. It's we're we're definitely somewhere on the the scale of getting towards linked open data, um, but maybe we don't have five stars yet, and there are things that we need to consider. If we choose the framework and we say this is how we're going to store it, then everyone will be able to you know run a query across multiple resources. 
Okay, so how do you reuse a schema? And so here I need to make a, a separation between ontologies and schemas, because um, you need both. Ontologies describe the world, so they talk about you know diseases and how are diseases related to one another, or the anatomy. You know how is a part of the heart you know fit into the rest of the heart, um, and schemas really describe your data, right? Or at least this is one way to define the two terms. They certainly are different, and there's a little bit of of um, disagreement about precisely what these are. But this will be the definition that I use when talking about them. Um, and so in the list, so if in the RIMBY list of, um, what, what's this say? It says relevant existing standards and ontologies. And I guess that could be also be schemas and ontologies. Um, there are, you know, obviously, as I just said, the, the ontologies are fine. So check um, using some of OME as a schema that, that RIMBY wants to reuse, I think will be fine. You know, if it's well defined in the XML and bioformats can read it out, you know, that's that's a process that we we know how to deal with. There are there is metadata certainly encoded in the IDR that isn't going to be as easy to use um, from other locations. So um, the key value pair. So are they well defined? For, well defined enough that someone else could build their entire repository on queries of them. Um, and I, I have screenshots of, of the channel information situation in the IDR later in the presentation. Um, there are places where I think that falls down and we will need to be able to build up um, ever new schemas that represent things more exactly so that they, they remain queryable and linkable, right? Um, moving around the graph further, uh, more complicated than reusing a schema would be extending a schema. schema. Um, and this is actually one of the true motivators of, of where all of this is coming from. So this is the, uh, the 4 dn uh, BINA paper from the, the Nature Methods Focus issue. Um, and what uh, originally it was the 4 dn extension of OME, and then it became the 4 dn 40N BINA extension, and then it became the 40N BINA CORUP extension of OME. Uh, so now it's just called NBOQ. So to kind of explain that, that progression over time, as more and people say, yes, we want to do this, um, what they wanted to do was take the OME schema, so here in the middle in blue, and extend the property. So OME has a model for instruments where we say, you know, this is a camera and this is an objective, and, you know, this is um, how we will write it down but it's not exact enough. And so someone else came up, so a large group of people came across, uh, came along and said, well, I want to write that down more exactly. W since OME is encoded in XSD, you really only have a couple of choices of how you can do that. You can say um, an NBOQ XML file refers to an OME XML file. So now we're in the multiple file situation. You can have an NBOQ XML, and it has to have an entire OME XML block inside of it. Also not great. Um, or, and this is actually what happened initially and inadvertently, is you have to say, well, we're going to just pull in all of these concepts, and then we now have a fork. Um, so XSD, as it currently stands, doesn't really provide the mechanisms to link between data uh, metadata elements in multiple schemas, nor how to keep existing code working. And so these are kind of the problems that we need to solve is um, how can we allow the community to extend things that they're you know clearly very engaged in without needing to submit every change request back to the team in Dundee, right? Because that's just not going to scale as, as a community. We want to have more and more people working on these things. That was my list of kind of reasons why I got into this. Um, I don't know if anyone has had any immediate ideas. I'll stop for a second and read the chat. Feel free to unmute. Um, and otherwise, I might also suggest that we start a break in just a second. That'll give everyone some time to think. So do any of those things that you think is appropriate, and I'll read the chat. Okay, so well, like you guys I just take the opportunity and the <laughs> silence to bring up my favorite topic on metadata, which is uh, 
the experimental parts. And now over the last few years, I've run a number of projects trying to reuse public data or, or pub, uh, data that have been published. And, and, and although the idea has actually good metadata, it doesn't reach the level that makes image data reusable uh, in my experience. So you want a lot more uh, of the experimental context captured in particular, some of these things are relatively simple. What are the relationships between the different images? So this is usually captured for high content screening where you know what well belongs to which plate and where, what kind of treatment it has undergone. But even that hasn't been standardized uh, fully. So sometimes things are con called controls, sometimes they are called positive, sometimes negative. So there's a whole range of um, definitions for, for what a treatment is, but um, this needs to be extended to, let's say, low throughput type of um, experiments. And it's not because you do high throughput or low throughput that you don't have controls, for example, you always have typically, but in low throughput experiments, this is actually not annotate, annotated at all at least in many cases. And then you try to go back to the papers and figure these things out. And that's actually not found. Then you have the reagents that are used, like for example, the antibodies. You should, in, if possible, try to have a clear description of what the antigen is. We've had, for example, one screen in the idea where they use two different antibodies against the same protein, or at least according to the paper, but the images look totally different. And the paper just glosses over that and doesn't say anything useful. Okay. <laughs> no, so but there are plenty yeah, of corner cases like yeah. this. Uh, where... Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a super point. We just, we can't obviously fix all those problems. I think from, from our side, and maybe for, the, for this conversation, what I would say is what we would like to do is provide a framework so that you could, or groups of, of motivated individuals could start building those representations, could start saying, okay, here's how we're going to write it down. And I, I think what I, so I think what's missing is a framework for you to even be able to do that. You know, and but then, that's, I understand. I want, just wanted to say kind of what needs to be included because- I agree completely. Data, data discussions I've had so far, and even in your examples, you've mentioned the basically instruments metadata, but that's the low hanging fruit. And I understand why it goes that way, but the, the, to make image data really reusable for, let's say end users like me, this is not the instrument metadata that matters. It's Agreed. the experimental one. Matthew? Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, I kind of basically agree with this. I think to some extent the focus on instrument metadata is a bit like the joke about the person that's looking for their keys under the light because that's where it's easiest to see rather than that's because where they lost them. But at the other end, they're trying to get people to submit the right metadata. Um, there, it gets to be very, very difficult if things get too complicated. So I think probably the way for some of those, some of those areas is focus projects where the, there's enough sort of funding and motivation to both develop a standard and get good metadata in in that standard and then probably couple to some immediate reuse cases because I think also this is incredibly fractal everywhere you look you can go into a huge amount of detail with the metadata and, and yeah. I think yeah what, what Josh said but great some way to tie these things together is pretty much the most critical and and funding and having motivated individuals who are working together will be key um, and they have our full support, but I guess it's um, also saying that we won't be able to do all of it. So how do we do it together as a community, right? Anyone else have either opinions on that or other things they'd like to add to this list? Don't see any hands. Uh... Guillaume has his hands raised. Oh, thank you. Go for it, Kim. Yeah, um, just, um, sorry, I lost my question. Um, okay, no, just about the chat and, and maybe a generic problem and I don't have an answer to, but maybe you have. Uh, some things don't belong into an ontology, but like is 
um, so say you buy uh, some chemical from a, a chemical uh, vendor, uh, is the URL pointing to the catalog entry of the chemical acceptable in RDF? Or can you, can you use that as a URI or how um, elastic is the, the, the specification? It's interesting. Um, yeah. I think it, it, everything is possible. Um, you have to be careful, obviously. So if, you know, if, if the URI is going to a, a commercial proprietary resource, you don't have necessarily the, the, the agreements and the, the trust that it will remain what you want it to be. So there will need to be repositories of those things as well. I assume we can have, um, um synonyms so that you could use either the public uri or the private uri interchangeably but yeah it's it's that's a effort in and of itself Hibuke? yeah i actually i don't know what the second half of the meeting will be but uh, on the since we just jumped into this uh, rdf link problem i was thinking about what happens if the linked info, um, the link disappears basically. So we need some trusted resources or linked resources. Yeah, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> so maybe I want to ask it now because you will answer it. Uh, uh, no, I, I, no. <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't answer it, no. So, but it's, it's a great point. It's something we need to deal with, but it's, yeah. you know, that's part of data management. I guess it's URI management, right? It's. It's a topic, I mean, that's basically uh, been discussed already for a few years about persistent yeah. identifiers. And typically, they, they, those are linked to uh, URIs in the ideal world. Um, but I haven't followed um, if the developments in, in recent times, but I guess there is, we will have to rely on the, on the, well-funded public repositories to to actually ensure that basically things last for some time and have a minimum of persistence anyone else i had super small experience on persistence yeah, that's where it gets hairy because we're talking about third-party repository, which are actually not represented in these chat, as far as I can tell. We're extensively using them on the IDR side. So PubChem, MTBI, Campbell, all these guys who are doing a great job. But for example, this requirement of I'm updating my catalog, my DB, I'm, I'm removing some term, I'm updating them. Do I maintain the link from the old to another one? Actually, the, the, this... The simple answer is that there is no, everyone agrees it's a nice to have, but everyone who has done it in a serious manner knows it's extremely complex to do in practice, right? It's, it's, it's a high bar. So you will find found that some of them will do it, some of them won't. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so how do you update from a version to a new version of a database? Um, probably requires a discussion with these entities as well understand how they want to operate and what are the good expectations, right? And that means we point to specific version of our catalog so that you always have a link and then you have to map it to the latest version. Do they maintain this kind of path forward? Um, I think that's where it also comes to which entities do you, I mean, there was a graph of <clears throat> which entities IDR and BIA use uh, that maybe there's some, this kind of requirement and discussion to have for any of them, right? I mean, what are our minimal expectations so that the link is, as you say, uh, remained valid for at least a period of time? Anyone else? Can I suggest we take a break till 10 minutes after the hour? If you want to use that time, you can think of new use cases and we'll collect them when we get back. And if not, we'll, we'll chug along. Yeah. All right. See everyone in just a moment.
your findable, whether it is really findable. I mean, it is a nice way to represent things, but whether it's findable may may not be as as simple, I think. But I don't know what what is the experience on that. Yeah, there's a very brief last slide uh, in the next section on that, so we can talk about it. I'll bring it up. It's it's a big problem, and it's. Why are you shaking your head, Sid? I'm just, I'm just looking at you two in the chat going. <laughs> if it were easier, I would change my change my name, but it's, it's too mm -hmm. difficult. Off again. So welcome back, everyone. Um, so were there any uh, amazing ideas while we are on the coffee break? Anyone want to keep adding to the list right now? Going once. Gosh, if I can make one quick sure. comment. Of course. And just, uh, just listening to the conversation, it's really interesting. I think when you, you know, for the use cases or the specific tasks here, focusing them on perhaps concrete applications, mindful of Jean Karim's statement that there will be probably domains which aren't well served, but nonetheless, you know, if there's a glass that's one third full, even that's not, you know, that's, that's at least a step in the right direction. So um, the specific types of queries, either in a specific type of disease, for example, or maybe even a organism biological model or a certain type of experiment, nonetheless would um, be um, useful, I think. I was also going to comment on uh, on use cases, uh, but I was more thinking along the line of finding use cases to maybe do gap analysis or or try to to fill in the gaps so that basically um, going for some use cases that would go beyond the um, metadata that are already captured and um, and trying to as a specific goal of the project to to fill in those those gaps. So how do you describe some of the the things I discussed before? How do you uh, capture uh, that information. And for example, I think we could also try, we should also try to work with the vendors to, to try to capture experimental metadata at the source, um, if possible. Um, yeah. Anyone else? So we'll have a hack and D at the end, so we can keep definitely keep going if we're if there's interest in time. Just in, um, in, just in, in the spirit of uh, what JK was saying, the in discussing, you know, even in context of IDR linking to things like protocol IO, where you have information of what type of protocol, uh, how your sample was uh, prepared, and I think that going in the in the spirit. So there are resources there. It's just maybe finding them and getting that knowledge uh, correctly linked. It's interesting. We recently got an email from protocol IO, sorry, protocols. Um, I haven't looked into how their metadata works. So that would be something, you know, a fairly low hanging fruit that would be interesting to try and just find out. <clears throat> would this be on the path they're, they're thinking about? So certainly something to to. To then uh, something I'm just thinking about, maybe to bring a little bit more complexity to the, um, we, we just also might want to link um, from within the image, so parts of images or or um, ROIs or anything to external uh, resources. So for example, um, in single cell data, if you have the genome of a cell for that you also have image, so how do you link that cell in its image context to its sequencing data? 
for example, or metabolomics data. I mean, for example, here at Embol, there's a group who basically fries, takes images and then fries cells one by one and collects uh, metabolomics profile of individual cells. How do you link the image with the cell and, and each cell to its um, uh, metabolomics profile, for example? Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna suggest we, we move along and make sure I don't, I can at least get through all the slides and then we'll use whatever time. So having people discuss is a great thing. All right, so um, let's talk about solutions. Uh, not solutions to everything. Um, so I'll have to disappoint my book here. But uh, first, what OME has tried in the past um, and then really what's been going on largely what I've been doing for the past year and maybe how that applies to the future. So this is a short history of OME metadata extensions. Um, many of you will know most of this, uh, but it does help to put it into context. Um, the first work on OME XSD, I'm clicking and nothing's coming. One second, I think I've shot myself in the foot. Okay. Okay. Um, the first work on OME XSD, certainly the certain first released version of OMX, OME XSD came out in 2003. Um, and that was largely a kind of a, a, a an encapsulating and a fest writing, um, writing down of what um, and an image should be. Now, in earlier versions, this predates me, uh, earlier versions of OME, it was actually possible to add things into the server and tables would get generated and it was a very dynamic system, um, actually very kind of flexible and extensible and all these things that we're talking about. Um, but I guess I would make the argument looking in hindsight that there wasn't a, an existing framework the, the very smart people who were building it were trying to write the framework and build OME at the same time. And so maybe we're now to a point where we can kind of go back and reevaluate some of those um, flexible decisions. But 2003 is kind of the point where things got written down in stone. It's like, okay, well, now we're going to be um, kind of static. So in 2006, um, this is uh, work on Omero began. And we needed something to, you know, it wasn't enough just to have the XSD representation. We needed to generate the database and we needed to have um, code in various languages. And so this is the pipeline that got set up. Um, it generates, and to this day, it still generates, you know, everything that is Omero on server on client side. Um, and that made it possible for us to work it wasn't necessarily something that the community could use for you know, defining their own extensibility. And in fact, only one person really ever made that possible, um, a friend, Jean-Luigi, who, so his uh, memorial was last year, so <laughs> getting choked up just thinking about him. Um, but he and his team at CRS4 actually took this and developed their own kind of flexible metadata system. And it was amazing. Um, but no one really followed in his footsteps. Um, and so we really, you know, we're still thinking about how to make this possible and um, accessible for the entire community. So then we ourselves went through processes of saying, okay, well, the model doesn't do what we need. We need to update it. Um, there was a, a multi-year, I think on the order of three year process of defining what high content screening uh, looks like, you know, like, you know, Jean, uh, Jean Karim is saying, you know, some of these conversations are very, very complicated. You know, even just what is a plate? You know, what is a high content plate? Um, so at, at a social level, it's very difficult and you need to take time and you need to have many discussions and a consensus process. But then at the technical level, it's also costly because then you update the XSD and then you run this pipeline and everything gets updated. And it's a lot of work to keep um, adjusting um, the software packages. Um, like, you know, from, from beginning to end. So that's something we needed to be aware of. Um, and 
So then around 2010, we added the concept of structured annotations. So, okay, so for every change, we don't want to go through this whole pipeline and update the code. What's a flexible way to allow people to add small annotations at various locations in the model? Um, and this concept was largely based on RDF. So the, the very first version of Omero was completely written in RDF. But knowing that, that that's a concept that we wanted to to emulate, we built it into OME XML. Um, but obviously, again, that's our building a framework and trying to use the framework. And that's always kind of a tricky position to be in. Um, a few years later, so here's 2013, the idea of key value pairs get added into uh, the model. So this is even more flexible. So it gives a little more um, power to the user to say, well, I don't just want to add, you know, a single string here. I actually want to start structuring my, my metadata. And obviously IDR built on that even further and said, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to formalize certain key value pairs and for example, make them linkable. So if you put a phenotype from an ontology and you follow it with a URL, then you'll get a nice icon to make things clickable. Um, those are those are features that are built into the IDR, but you can obviously see how that could be part of a larger framework that we all want to make use of. So that that's this progression here at the bottom, kind of OME's attempt to go from completely flexible then to static and and kind of struggling with this idea of well how do we how do we balance um, flexibility and maintainability of the code, and from there uh, other members of the community have jumped in. So Susanna. Um, built Endemic, or what's now called Endemic, the metadata editor for microscopy, and basically said, okay, well, um, OME and Omero don't allow you to modify the metadata that's that's discovered from bioformats. Let's find a way to represent that in the key value pairs um, to allow users to overlay more metadata on top. Um, you can see this is kind of using kind of a, a key-like structure similar to what bioformats was doing with the vendor metadata. Again, kind of an opportunity here for um, maybe some standardization. And as I mentioned earlier, 4D and, and now NBOQ starts, ex so this is 2018, starts extending OME XML, actually forking and, and building a new model. And that really triggered these conversations about, well, we need to take a step back and decide, well, first decide what the framework is going to be, and then ultimately build the framework to make it possible for this type of ext extension to happen. Um, Norio Kobayashi in, at Riken actually did a, a first version of this. So he hand wrote OME AL, so converted OME XML into RDF, uh, and then used that representation to, to extend it. So here extending it for electron microscopy. Um, so this is the proof of concept that said, okay, we can use this as the underlying framework um, and build on top of it. But again, I think I think what we're dealing with here is the fact that this is, again, at that lowest level. So as a community, for really all of us to start adopting, either we need to all become as proficient as Norio, which is going to be difficult, or we need help. You know, we need we need the, the, these pipelines and these mechanisms and these agreements so that we can make use of this at a higher level. Um, and just getting back to kind of some of the discussions around uh, the manufacturers. This is this is still ongoing. So Corp Lemmy is having conversations with the manufacturers, and they are deciding models. You know, on a regular basis. I think um, is it every two weeks they're meeting and and publishing on protocols I/O. So specifications that would be appropriate again, just for the hardware side of things, which is perhaps the easier question. But it's but it's proof that you know groups of of motivated individuals can get together, can write down. You know these agreements for specifications, and we really need the framework to then be able to encapsulate this and make all of our software work with it, right? So how are we going to share this in a fair manner, and it doesn't get just lost somewhere um, in the metadata? So that's the progression. Did I forget anything super critical from anyone, or any questions on that? Okay. So the question after that becomes, well, okay, how would we how would we improve on this. Um, and I guess that's what I've been doing through 2022. Um, I'll call it a linked data adventure. Um, thanks to Jason. So for many of you may know, Jason has is program manager for the Delta Tissue Project, which is a welcome leap program 
Um, so this is outside of OME. This is looking into uh, three disease areas. So um, triple negative breast cancer, glioblastoma, and tuberculosis. Um, and working with you know, these fine individuals to come up with a tissue time machine for figuring out, you know, can we predict the state of what's going on um, in tissue? Uh, Jason has presentations that are online. I'll leave all that to, to you to ask him. Um, but since they have all these modalities and they have imaging and they have non-imaging, um, the question gets raised, well, how do you find all of that? You know, it, it is exactly the, the, the this questions we're struggling with here. And so here um, with German bioimaging, we were tasked with trying to develop a linked data platform. So how could we take all the resources, the data resources from these various groups who, you know, they're doing their clinical acquisitions, they're, you know, talking to their patients, doing whatever analysis they need to do, um, and then make all of that data findable. Um, so we've been using that to prototype exactly, you know, the, the, the types of questions that we want to answer here. People are coming with their spreadsheets, uh, taking those spreadsheets and making them linkable. That requires having an agreement on the naming and on the structure of, of the data. And then at that point, it should be possible to write a Sparkle query across this graph of data, right? So that's that was the starting point um, and what we've been investigating and, and building. What that looks like in practice, though, ends up looking more like this, at least currently, which is each of the disease areas provides their own CSV. You know, they have what they're interested in capturing. Um, there is then some kind of uh, pipeline, so a Python script or something that then turns that into RDF. We use a tool called LinkML, which we'll look at uh, in more detail in just a second, to generate JSON. And that can then be used to, to generate websites and, and to search and everything else. But in reality, so a single one of these models from, from Python kind of looks like this. So it's it's quite detailed. So you have you know hundreds of columns of data, that's fine. Um, but when you try to model them and you try to actually understand what they're trying to represent, it's actually quite rich. Um, you have you know the different um, when was the first and when was the last um, diagnosis of a particular patient? Where is the tumor located, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and, you know, you can imagine that this is not the level that you necessarily want to be working at. So this is the model. This isn't the data itself. This is just a representation of the model that we're trying to express here. Um, and obviously having an easier way to read this would be, again, so these, these layers of abstraction, so that it becomes easier and easier to work with these things. Um, the tool that we found that is the best candidate at the moment. And so here, I guess I'm I'm soliciting opinions from all of you, is LinkMLIO. It's a markup language for linked data. That would be kind of the, the short version. It's written in YAML. So these are fairly small, but you're welcome to, I mean, this is the, the website. So you could, maybe it's just easiest for you to look at the website. Um, it's a much simpler representation of just basically writing down, these are the classes and these are the, the attributes on the classes that can obviously generate uh, JSON-LD, also can generate uh, Python and other classes. And we'll kind of look at the, the what the framework provides um, in just a second. If you really wanna get into the details, probably the largest model I know of that exists is called BioLink. Um, the model file itself is about 10,000 lines of code. It's trying to represent genes and diseases, phenotypes, pathways, um, individuals, i.e. patients, and, and substances. So this is one um, kind of basis for a knowledge graph. It may be one that we as a community want to adopt and build on top of, or maybe we would want to do something similar. You know, we would have something that's um, a parallel development, or possibly, you know, LinkML is not the, um, the right platform. But I think those are the types of questions that we need to ask is what can we do to ease our development and, and have really at the end of the day, more people working together with us. So outside of the bioimaging space, helping to build these platforms. Okay, so let's look at what LinkML does in kind of a very, very simple way. So this is a, 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 the simplest hello world that I can make. All the stuff at the top is largely boilerplate. And then really you're writing down what are the classes and what are the um, what are their attributes. And then there are various tools. There's one called generate. So gen owl. 
and that'll generate an owl file, so an ontology based on whatever you have in the CAML file. So that's fairly straightforward. And I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm I'm giving this example for a reason, which is this seems easy to read, this seems hard to read, right? And we want to be as far on the left of this kind of progression as possible and make things as easy as for ourselves as a community to, to build on. Um, the, the available schema transformations, there may be some that I left out here, um, looks roughly like this. So we looked at link ML to owl. You can then also generate Python classes. So you can generate here Pydantic classes. Uh, Pydantic is a library that makes it a little bit easier to work with Python models. Um, and then once you have Pydantic, you can use anything that's available in the Pydantic space, like here, Aerodantic, which generates um, entity relationship models, and you can kind of build on top. Um, you can also generate JSON schema or JSON LD context, um, all things that we have prototyped, at least in the NGFF space ourselves, um, coming into 2022. Um, actually, I can't remember when we did it. Maybe it was at the beginning of the year. Um, We've also looked at other platforms that are similar to this. Um, one is called Open Minds, coming from the brain space. Um, others have have struggled with these issues too, and I guess um, kind of looking for the the tallest shoulders that we can stand on. Um, one interesting feature here is that the the spreadsheet node here on the graph. Um, it's possible to write your model in a spreadsheet. So if that's something that your community is interested in. Um, this is actually what Katerina uh, and the 40N, uh, I guess the NBOQ group were doing, is they have a spreadsheet, which is their central representation. Um, and the hope was then to take that and then generate the, the LinkML YAML model from that. So that may be something that we could do. I tested the reverse. It's technically possible, but generating the spreadsheet doesn't work currently. And, and that's a similar theme that some of these um, conversions, these transformations that are available from LinkML don't work as, as well as some of the others. Um, I guess that's that's natural in a, in a growing uh, community in it, but it's something we would need to be aware of. So that would there would need to be development investment to make everything work precisely for what we want to achieve. But it does feel very much like the platform that we built for Omero. So there is this way to take a core representation and build all the various facets that you need to get your work done. So those are the schema transformations. Looking very briefly at the data transformation, so also we've tried various of these out. Um, the conversion from and to tabular data didn't work as well as expected. Um, that was actually the one I was primarily interested in, is being able to take all the tables from all of the, um, the clinical samples in tabular format and not require them to change anything in their tables and generate the RDF. Um, that didn't work as well as expected, partially because of design decisions about how they map um, multiple columns into JSON and, and back and forth, but that's something that could be worked on. What did work certainly is once you're in the RDF space, you can say, okay, I want to go into these other simpler representations like JSON and YAML. Um, that looks something like this. You have a command, it's link ML convert, and I can take, um, I'm saying convert from turtle, i.e. from RDF, convert it into JSON uh, based on this schema, this hello world that I'm, I showed you a second ago, and take all of the images from this file. And then you get you know, simple JSON, which is a list of all of the images that were in your input data. So, um, there are various generators that I haven't tested, like protobuf, GraphQL, Shackle, generating documentation, so markdown pages about the, the model, Java, Alchemy, which is for databases. It kind of goes on and on. Um, it's a fairly broad space. Um, and like I said, I would be interested in hearing uh, what others have to say if they're interested in, in trying it out. Sorry, yeah. John Karim has his hand raised. Thank you. Go for it. Yeah, I don't know. Again, it's uh, just something as you were talking um, about the, this process, it, it reminded me quite a lot about the process that one goes through to design actually a relational database using a business object model. I am just wondering in the end if we are just not making our lives more complicated by wanting to use uh, this instead of designing a, a, basically a, a database schema 
which would also offer some performance with indexing and everything compared to all these uh, things. So, and, and, and you got to this by basically saying that was you were doing for Homero. And in the end, I'm just thinking if we would not be better served by having a federation of databases that have all the same uh, uh, schema rather than uh, this loosely, more loosely typed uh, JSON or YAML definitions. Um, I mean, just an idea, maybe it's too old school, maybe <laughs> for these days. Um, I but, think it's it's a fair question, Jean Karim, and, and I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So, if a database does what you want, by all means, you're right. It's definitely simpler. It's definitely more performant. Um, and if we knew what all the schemas were, so everything that we as a community wanted to say, then yes, we could work on a federated system of those databases. So you know, you could you know, if Omero could store everything you wanted to store. Um, today, then you, we could talk. So as opposed to having this conversation, conversation, we could have, you know, a two hour workshop and we could talk about, well, what does it take to federate Omero and something we've thought about. What you don't have then is the ability for other communities to come in and say, well, we want to do something else and we're not done yet. We're going to keep doing this thing and it's not going to be centralized. So the so, the, so it's, there's two two layers. There's the there's the schema layer and there's the data layer. So a federation of Omeros is at the data layer, and it's a very interesting question. If you want to federate the schemas, if you want to let multiple groups define the schemas without centralizing their definition, you need something else. That's what I've not been able to solve to date with what we have. Yeah. No, I'm I'm also thinking maybe along the line of using that process, but then constraining the output to be um, basically in, uh, in relational language or uh, as basically relational database uh, output. I don't think that, I don't think that work. I mean, so I think here, so with this framework, um, you could have someone, so let's think about the vendors. You know, a vendor comes along and they says, well, I, they say, I want to write down exactly what my scope is going to produce, all the metadata. With that schema specification, and it doesn't even have to be link ML, it can be anything, they could generate a database that would be, um, that would be relational. But another relational system will know nothing about that. And there's, you, so to, to make those two systems interoperate in any way, you must have a link. And so that's what link data is all about. Ibuka, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just um, um, basically was uh, going to agree with you based on my experience with a, a cancer research project. Um, we we tried to use the OME XML. We actually used the um, structured annotations and sort of put our own um, schema inside that. <clears throat> uh, also for the dumping the um, the original metadata from the propriety images, raw, raw images. But I mean, when you have new instrumentation or an ongoing project, as you said, you don't even, I mean, even within a relatively small project, you don't have those definitions and uh, let alone the whole, you know, bioimaging community. I think it's really, not easy at all to go with relational database. Uh, I think the it's the extensibility problem that would be kind of the major obstacle, I guess, yeah, from what you're saying. But yeah, I mean, it's a valid point, but maybe we could also have a pass towards that. It's just that I wanted to offer slightly different uh, options that maybe um, is also more implementable or easier to go towards. Um, I don't know, because I mean, we already have a, a database in, in, in Omero. So whether that's a good starting point or whether we want to take the, the, the schema and convert it to, to a database instead of just uh, or, or a bunch of JSON files, or I don't know. Um, it's just that the process that was described is kind of the same that 
people go through when they want to design a database um, using this type of object modeling. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. So, and the hope is to be able to have tools like one uses in, so like we use in Omero to simplify our lives, to generate as much of the code as possible so that things get simpler and simpler, but that underneath things are still linkable. And that's kind of the, the, the whole trick that we're trying to get to, right? And so that, that requires basing ourselves on this, you know, the RDF assembly language as opposed to pure SQL. Um, let me... Let's see. So I only have a couple more slides. Let me get through those and we maybe just want to switch. I'll, I'll go back to the other Josh and we can have kind of a larger conversation. Um, the important bit here, and I won't, as Jason would say, I won't belabor this, is that you can import other um, specifications. So here I am started to write a specification or a schema for for a channel, for a channel model, and that's what I knew we needed in um, the IDR. And I can import the Hello World, and then I can extend things from this other schema, right? Um, and then I have all the power of of doing that, and that can work either locally, so I can have all these old files, or each of us could actually host this file at a HTTP resource, and that becomes the representation of our model. So you could imagine the vendors actually hosting this file, and um, and someone could say, well, I want to then import Zeiss's model for their channels um, and make use of that. And I bring up channels kind of over and over, and I don't think we're going to have time. I had debated whether or not we could actually have um, use LinkML to sit together and try to develop a model. Um, let's save that for, for a follow-on. But these are the current values, thanks to Sebastian, of all the channels, or all the channels up to IDR 109. Um, in the IDR, um, and you can, I think you can get a feel for the diversity in these. Some of them are separated with slashes, some of them are separated with colons and with semicolons. Um, you know, I, once again, so maybe in, maybe this is a truth across the board, is whenever you get to the, get yourself into the situation where you are encoding complex concepts, complex semantics, into a single string and you are making the decision, well, am I going to use an equal sign here? Or am I going to use a semicolon? What am I doing? You're building a language, right? And if you're building a language, you probably want help building that language. Don't do it yourself. I guess maybe that's the biggest take home of all. And so all these situations where we're doing this and where we're having this problem, we probably want to go back and, and reevaluate. Um, this is shifting gears, but this question did come up during the break. So Ken asked, um, aren't there performance problems with RDF? Um, and I will say yes. Um, and I'll talk to, so this, this slide is basically about my experience with uh, Delta Tissue um, and the, or I guess IDR and Delta Tissue and the performance problem. Um, knowing that there's a Mer Omero integrated into the Delta Tissue system, we, we asked the question, well, can we turn an Omero into RDF? So it's not just tabular data that we're getting. We also have an Omero, or we will have an Omero. Um, and so we tested on the IDR. We took the HPA, which is the largest data set in the IDR, um, used kind of complicated SQL and parallel processing to generate the RDF. I won't try to share any of that with you. Um, it got the job done, but it wasn't pretty. Um, and it generated 200 million triples of RDF data. Uh, that's a bunch. So that's about 2% of um, Wikidata. Um, and so that's probably, so doing that with all of our imaging data is not going to work, right? It's That's not the level um, that we necessarily want to be sharing our RDF. So I still think as an exchange format, you know, I'm sharing one image with the bioimage archive, or I'm doing one thing, you know, I'm taking one set of the data set um, it's manageable. When you start to get an, okay, am I going to represent all metadata that exist in this space? Probably not. And so that's where we need to try to balance. You know, we balance the flexibility versus maintainability and usability. Um, and one way of doing that, um, in a conversation with Jean-Marie, I called this semantic compression. I haven't researched the literature. I don't know if that's a term that's already been used. Um, I we'll need to do that. But 
you know, so you can imagine that HPA is kind of this this higher this hierarchy of various levels. You have the study, i.e., the project. Then you have all the antibodies. You have all the images. They have all their key value pairs. It goes and goes, um, and that makes up the the two hundred million triples. Um, in many cases, we might want to drop some of the intermediate nodes, right, and go. Okay, we're just going to attach in one particular data resource. I want to take the genes and I want to attach them directly to the study so that if someone comes and does a search for a gene, they will find the study. And then after that, they will need to figure out what they're doing. Um, and I guess the, the take home, as I think, you know, I don't know how many times I've said this, is, well, you need help doing that. So, you know, I can write the script that does this and I can generate this platform. So this search engine that someone can search on but you probably want the people who are setting up the schema to make these decisions. You know, what information can be omitted in certain use cases and that we could have conversations around these use cases so that maybe even in the, the link ML or whatever, in the framework itself, we say, okay, when you, when you want to save space, do this, right? Um, or maybe we just have a couple of hard-coded uh, decisions that we make as a community. This is how we're going to compress things. Um, but it's definitely a very real conversation that we need to have. Um, what I did do, and this is very alpha version, but it lets anyone who has an Omero play around with it, is you can take Omero RDF. It's, an, it's pip installable. Um, and you can run it against your Omero, giving it an image or a project. Very similar, very similar to Omero CLI transfer. And it will just spit out a bunch of RDF. Um, and that may be a way for us to start comparing between different projects. Well, what are we actually talking about at this very low level? Um, and we will need to have conversations about what do these URLs look like? Are these URLs going to be long-term maintainable? Are they, you know, what we were talking about earlier, are they PIDs? How do we represent key value pairs? How do we represent ontologies? We need to have all of those conversations if this is the path that we're going down. Okay, that was the end of the, the, the link data adventure in Delta Tissue. Um, we're kind of getting to the close here. We have about 15 more minutes. I'll do my quick summary and then I'll turn off the slides and we can just chat. Um, so kind of remembering what we talked about for the past hour and 45 minutes. Uh, we covered what is link data. Uh, we talked about the problems in the link data space or so in the fair data. Um, what are the things that we want to be able to achieve? Reminder, NFDI for bioimage will be pursuing the solutions, but uh, others are doing the same thing. We should work together as much as absolutely possible. Um, there's the potential to use RDF as the common low layer. Uh, I'm actually fairly convinced. If someone can convince me of another low level, level um, platform, I would love to hear it. So I guess that's exactly the kind of uh, feedback I need. And I think LinkML is a potential higher layer that we could use, uh, but it's going to need some work if we do that. Uh, concrete next steps, I think training across the board. So um, NFDI for bioimage will keep getting uh, trainings. Um, maybe we could even talk to the carpentries. Uh, the library carpentries does have a leaked data session on um, that's available online. We would need to build all this up in the bioimaging space. So um, that's something to be done. Um, obviously, more funding if you can get it. And and as both Jean Cream and Jason kind of pointed to, if you have a problem, you know, you have something you need to make possible, um, looking to get funding for that, and then we will provide the framework and everything for you to, to do the work you need to do, similar to Cora Plimi. Um, I know Stephanie has, um, again, German funding for building a, uh, what is it? I, I'm blanking. It's the... A particular Omero database. Tom, you're here. Speak. It's the uh, the membrane dye database. Membrane. Thank you. I, <laughs> I couldn't get past metabolites for whatever, but yeah. So it's a, a entire Omero just of the membrane markers and all the metadata that's needed for that. So that's a very you know focused project. And if any of you have a focused project like that, would love to work with you. You know that's. That can be defining the experimental metadata that Jean Cream so desperately wants or whatever. But I think those are the kind of conversations. And then we add those 
those those nodes into this graph, you know, and then we will define how does that work together with all the other metadata schema representations. And um, the more the merrier, right? Um, if we choose um, more than one framework, I'm not saying it's it's it, like you know I can't stop anyone from from going and choosing something else. Um, just a caveat that we will then need something like we will need converters, so something like we have from bioformats today. So to go from from framework one to framework two, that's fine. That can be done. It's just something that um, has to be kind of planned into the costing. But I will say once again, so the fewer frameworks we can have, the better. And then we can share all the GUIs and the tools and all the the good stuff that we can show to users at the very top, right? So that's kind of the the, the grand plan. Um, oh, and just thanks from my side. So obviously all the funding on the University of Dundee side that has supported all this stuff for many, many years. Um, the new funding on the German bioimaging side, um, obviously thanks to Jason for, I guess, having found me in Germany and let me work for the University of Dundee for the past six, 15, 16 years. I don't know how long. Um, and I guess Stephanie for bringing me back to Germany and thanks to all of you. So this is exciting to see kind of the, the community, the OME community growing and doing more stuff. So um, that's it from my side. I will turn off the slides and we can choose if we're going to look at either of these uh, HackMDs or if we're going to um, just chat. Thanks. Matthew, the question, Josh? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, well, more, more, uh, well, actually a comment and then a question. And firstly, thanks, Josh. That was really, really good. Um, very thought-provoking and, and very useful. Um, a kind of very early sort of trip report experimenting with Link ML. Um, and one of the reasons, I, well, part of the reason I've been doing that is that Josh suggested that I should do. And um, part of the reason for that is that back in um, the spring, we were looking for a way to represent the, the, the source of truth for our implementation of Remedy, because we need a working, a better working metadata model for the Bioimage Archive. Um, and we needed an immediate implementation and we, we picked something back then. But if I had known about LinkML, then I would have picked it. And it is, in my view, a very good way to reasonably straightforwardly model schema and produce pretty much all the outputs you need already and with good extensibility for producing things that you might need. And because, although in a sense, it claims to be completely cross domain, the original use case is linking biological data. So it tends to have the kind of things that you want in a biological data modeling language, like the ability to restrict entry fields to parts of ontologies and things like that. Um, and I think we will probably actually convert what we have into link ML because independent of what everybody else does, I think it solves a lot of the problems that we have. But I would sort of give a plus one to Josh's encouragement to go and look at it if you have data modeling um, queries. And one caveat is that the documentation is good, but not complete. So just as an example, I spent a while trying to, trying to use its flexible annotation specification to work out how we could codify examples for things in the specification, because that's something we do already, because it's useful for submitters to have, this is what this particular piece of information should look like, only to discover it has a way to represent examples specifically, um, but it's not very well documented. Um, I had a question for Josh, but maybe we'll come back to that, because I, I see Christian's hands up. Well, my question was certainly not meant to interrupt you, Matthew, but um, I, actually I have uh, also a question or a comment that goes in a similar direction even. Also, thanks, Josh, for this overview. I think this has been the most comprehensive and, and greatest overview I've seen altogether of these topics. So that's that's really valuable. Um, what we are doing at the moment, so I'm working in Germany in a smaller scale project focusing on the implementation of Omero databases in Germany. It's called I3DPO. And um, so, the problem that we have is that um, it's it's even hard enough already to in in such a dedicated environment to get users to actually start using key value pairs and tags 
And uh, we also aim, of course, to, to bring them towards uh, using then ontology terms and not just coming up with their texts on their own. So what's a little bit difficult for us on that side, because it's going to be a process until people are, are ready to um, more and more use these things, is what can we recommend already that is not going to get in the way with novel developments that later on uh, people will say, oh, you have structured it in that way, but this is now totally not compatible with uh, the way the community has gone. Like, how do I put the ontology reference? There is the IDR style, there is like from the in the RDM bytes uh, from Laura Cooper, she's suggesting how to implement Gramby in Omero. That's one example. Um, how do I also link to the whole ontology that contains the domain knowledge that is maybe also linked there? So, so can we also have sort of say intermediate levels of saying this is a safe space to start working in this direction, even though the whole complexity is not yet defined and even though you don't understand it yet. Wow. Um, yeah, that's the problem. Um, I don't have an answer. I think tools will help. Um, that won't be immediate. Oh, if I, if I want to do one thing immediately, what it would probably be would be allow someone to paste in a URL from OLS into Omero. I don't exactly know where, and so I guess kind of looking at will or, you know, I would, I think the use case or the, the a typical user workflow would be, I need to find a term that represents X. I go to OLS and I'm going to search because I need the ontologies. I need to have a representation that's more complex. I need to see, you know, a drop down and then I need to read all the descriptions and I need to compare four or five descriptions. And then this is what Andra, who works with me on the on the Delta Tissue project does. He spends, he said working on Delta Tissue is a little bit like getting a medical degree because he, he spends his time learning about these concepts. That's actually the harder part is making sure you understand the ontology. If you know the ontology, it's easy, but I think most people don't know the ontology. And so where do we send people? so they can have a good interaction with the ontologies and then make it as easy for them as possible to take whatever term they want. Or maybe we limit them. You know, maybe there's some validation. They, they bring a URL, they give it to a marrow, and you tell them, oh, we really don't want that term here. But they're probably going to do it anyway. So, <laughs> you know, you, you somehow you want to, you want to simplify that process. Um, and I think today, you know, if, if we're doing this in the next I, uh, I won't I won't estimate how long that will probably show up as a key value pair. That maybe is completely fine, but we probably want to build tools that when like um, going back to Eric's transfer mechanism, when when you type in Omero CLI transfer, what you get out should probably be the real ontology term. It should somehow transfer you back to the URL. Same thing with Omero RDF. You know, so the, the key value terms, so we, we need to standardize what the IDR, for example, has done with the key value pairs so that we're getting the ontologies back out losslessly. And I think that would already be a pretty good workflow. But I'll shut up now and see if anyone else has something they would rather have, because that's what we're here for. Guillaume, this hand raised. Uh, Guillaume? Yes. Thanks. Uh, so from another uh, viewpoint point of view, um, what we plan to do is use ISA as the entry point and as the first step into structuring data because I feel it's easy for biologists to, to identify how, uh, how this makes sense. And it's already a lot of work to, to like say what is a sample and what is um, uh, and what is an assay in your uh, experiments and I feel that it's a good entry point to to start uh, naming things with uh, controlled vocabularies, but I don't know your your what what's your feeling on that. Ibuka, you want to add something on ISA? No, actually, I wanted to ask you something about the last thing you said, so maybe I'll wait. Okay. Um, yeah, I think ISA. Is so 
the conversation we just had, which I think we're getting back to, is on ontologies. And so that's that is kind of the simpler case. Um, for me, ISA falls under what was it, number four. So you want to reuse a schema as opposed to you want to use an ontology. Remember that you know, one is about the world, one is about data. Um, ISA is about the data, or maybe that's unfair, but I think it it ends up influencing the schema. So I think we need to think about it that way. Um, there's a good uh, thread on image SC for anyone who's interested in ISA. Guillaume, I don't know if you have it in front of you. You could paste it. Um, there are a couple of different ways we can implement it, you know, either as, again, as annotations or, or some kind of mapping between Omero and ISA. But I think the ultimate goal is similar to the ontology that when, when uh, it's not exactly an Omero agnostic user. So everything that's in the Omero space we control and we can kind of do whatever we want, right? But when you're taking the data out of Omero, the user has a right to expect that it turns back into what they want, right? If they put an ontology in, they want the ontology to come back out. If they put, if they do something to say, this is ISA, sorry, you can't see my hand, my microphone's in the way. You know, this is ISA, I'm going to put it into Omero. When they get it back out, they somehow want to still be linked to ISA, right? Now, that sounds like ISIS. Um, so you you want to preserve all that information, and I think we we'll, we will need to we will need to figure out how to do that. That may be Guillaume as simple as adding a couple more triples. So you add all the triples for I have a project. The project has a data set. The data set has these images, and then you also say the data set is here's how you map the data set into the ISA model. That would be a pretty I think achievable end if we want more complexity or more richness from from in 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 interoperating with ISA, then it might get more complicated. Thank you for the link. Anyone else on ISA before we go back to ontologies? Cool. I hope. It's not even about the ontologies, actually. Okay. It's about what you said about putting something into Amero and then using the, the software when you dump the, everything onto the disk. I was wondering what format then it would be. So not in RDS, but JSON-LD or like? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, currently, so going back to what, you know, the only tool that really does this today is, is Eric's transfer. Um, and currently that's XML. Um, it's a mix of, of XML and I guess other binary stuff. So I guess a pretty early doors, yeah, I would I would like to see a version that also generated um, an RDF format that would probably be JSON LD. Um, but I guess there's no reason it can't be turtle. So again, kind of going back to what I said in the very, very early slides, all representations of RDF are absolutely identical. They are completely semantically equivalent, which is actually one of the really nice things. So to some degree, we as a community don't have to care. It's not our business to say this is exactly how you have to structure your data. If, you're, if your metadata graph, if two data me metadata graphs match, that should be all that we care about. But maybe we need to care and just say JSON-LD. That will simplify things. Um, ultimately, I could also see you know, having an export to NGFF with the the metadata inside of it. That's obviously one of the um, one of the goals here. But we know that for a long, you know, I expect for quite some time we won't be able to get away from the original files, and so we we need to think about that. And that's really what Eric's prototyping, um, and maybe we we standardize on some mix of that and what bioimage archive would accept and i would imagine the idr team would be interested in thinking about well what would a submission to idr possibly look like that's been zipped up beforehand and so again take our very real problems what are the things that we struggle with every day so each of us and try to make those simpler while reducing the total number of file formats that we're using right so that's always the Anyone want to add on to that? Oh, and I notice I'm three minutes over. No. 
Yeah, I was just going to mention, and because you had a bullet point about arrow crate, and that might be a vessel that that become the the final arbitrary. So this is, uh, you know, BIA except arrow crate IDR is, you know, having a, a, a statement indicating what how it need to be formatted in a in a way that could be a candidate potentially. Yeah, we have, so JM more than anyone else, I've had some initial conversations with the RO Crate community. If anyone else is actively using RO Crate, for example, jean cream I assume on the USC side and with Galaxy, you are, you know, I think we could, we could take those conversations and we could, you know, the, everything we did today, we could also do and say, well, okay, well, what would be the relationship here and kind of build on that. So that would be an exciting thing to do, but not today, because I know we have to disappear. Any but other? Last Just, comments uh, to mention so for um our crates and, and potential link to imaging, I think your uh link would be the CRS for people. Yeah, Simone, yeah, yeah. trust in Simone and, and his team. So yeah. yeah, um, we've been in touch once and we'll get in touch again. Yeah. Anyone else? Last thoughts, famous last words, tweet length or shorter. Mastodon toot toot length, toot length is pretty long. Yeah. Going once. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. We will see Bye. you on Thursday.